Hello, everyone. My name is John Gilbert, uh, and I'm an Emeritus Professor of Family Planning right here at UCL. My title might need a bit of explanation. So here goes. Sex and the planet. The Quran and the Bible both say that there was a first man called Adam. And allegedly, God said to Adam, right at the beginning, I've got three bits of news for you. Two bits of bad news, two bits of good news, one bit of bad news. Which would you like to hear first? And so Adam says, let's have the good news first. So God says to Adam, first bit of good news, I'm going to create for you an organ. I don't think you'll actually find this story in the Quran or the Bible. This organ is called the brain. Bet that fooled some of you. <laughs> and with the brain, you can think and you can feel, and you can devise lovely names for all these beautiful animals and plants I'm making for you. So Adam said to God, uh, thank you, God, that's good news. What's the next bit of good news? Next bit of good news, says God, I'm going to create for you another organ. This organ is called the penis. With a penis, you can have a lot of pleasure with your wife, Eve. And if you do it right, she'll enjoy it too. And then you'll have children, and you can bring them up uh, and get them to steward this beautiful world that I'm creating for you. So Adam says to God, that sounds like good news too. So what's the bad news? And God said to Adam, you will never be able to use both at the same time. <laughs> and that's the problem of unplanned pregnancy in the world. And it's basically a problem for men, particularly because of this image here. They don't have the babies, and they don't bother, basically, as long as they get their oats. We need more of the wise male monkey on the left there. Uh, and wise men uh, are much better at preventing unplanned pregnancy, which can be as all of us know, a disaster. Okay, but is sex dangerous? Actually dangerous? Well, I'd argue it actually is. There are direct dangers to humans from this activity. First of all, heart attacks or strokes, again, mostly the men. <laughs> Secondly, sexually transmitted infections to both genders. Otherwise, the direct risks applied to uncontracepted sex, and unfairly, primarily to women. Maternal mortality is a disaster in the world still. It's come down, but it's awful to think that 800 women are dying needlessly just from having babies a day in the world. And 47,000 per year are dying from unsafe abortions in the world. And they're certainly unplanned pregnancies. And maternal morbidity, those horrible fistulae, leaking smelly urine, that's 20 times mortality. We've not reached this stage yet, but the indirect dangers of uncontracepted sex, sex without family planning, are well summarized by this picture here. We haven't reached standing room only yet, but we have got 7,000 million humans on the planet rising by 80 million every year. That's the population of either Egypt or of Germany. Unsustainable, patently unsustainable, particularly when you connect the rise in numbers with the footprints everybody has. And all of us in this room, I'm sure we're trying to reduce our environmental footprints, our carbon footprints and so on, aren't we? But a greenhouse gas producing city for one and a half million people is built somewhere in the world every week. So as well as reducing footprints, for any halfway decent future for the planet, we also have to have fewer feet doing the footprint. It's hardly rocket science, is it? The good news, every year, more people reduce their carbon footprints. Again, I'm sure that's true of us here. The bad news, every year, more people. We were told, again, according to the Quran and the Bible, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Don't you think, folks, when you combine my last two slides of the numbers and our footprints, we've fulfilled that commandment, we've obeyed that one. God never told Adam and Eve to overfill the earth. 
And I think we're on the way to doing just that. That's the indirect danger. So if we go through this, less uncontraceptive sex happening through accessible and entirely voluntary family planning being able to be used by every couple in the world is a win-win thing. First of all, for women, all those direct dangers we discussed, and for the planet, these indirect dangers of the population explosion. Or, as UNICEF said right back in 1992, family planning could bring more benefits to more people at less cost than any other single technology now available to the human race. And yet we're not putting the resources into it that we should be. If I had time, I could argue that every one of the major threats you see on this slide, the 21st century challenges that we are getting scared about, all of us in this room, one after the other, all these things here, population is the driver. It's not the sole cause. There's other things in every case. But it is a driver of these challenges. And it's not just me saying that. Sir David Attenborough, whom all of you know, a national treasure, he is a patron of our organization called Population Matters. And he has said, I have not seen a world problem that wouldn't be easier to solve with fewer people and ultimately impossible with ever more. Now let's just quickly consider three of these great threats and how population impacts on them. Very quickly, first of all, biodiversity. You're all aware, I know, that the sixth great extinction is happening, the first extinction of species that has been caused by one species uh, uh, impacting on all the other ones. Too many humans means habitats destroyed. Go back to that footprint of a city. A city needs land for itself, needs land outside it for crops. It destroys inadvertently many, many habitats and many, many species are threatened as a result. And here uh, we have ones in the UK that are in real threat. The small tortoiseshell uh, hedgehogs have come down to only a million in the whole country, a dramatic reduction we've just been told in the last month from the Nature Survey. And natterjack toads nearly extinct. Now, you may not be too worried about the old natterjack toad disappearing off the planet, but we all ought to be worried about this if we were to lose our bees. And again, okay, let's talk about neonicotinoid uh, pesticides, but it's also human interference by just sheer numbers of us on habitats for all these species. Secondly, conflict and violence. I happen to have been born in a country called Burundi. And then my parents moved, uh, after I was about three years old, to Rwanda. And most of you will remember that Rwanda had the world's fastest genocide in 1994, where 800,000 people were killed in a space of three months. This is me on a recent visit there. And I learned Kinyawanda before I learned English, because my playmates in those days were just the local people. I even spoke the local language to my sister. Um, well, now, if you go to Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, here is the genocide memorial. And there's my son and Harriet uh, showing us around. And she said, under these huge concrete slabs, we placed 250,000 of the bodies. And what was really poignant for me was that my boyhood friend that I used to play with Busi and his uh, wife and two children were there. Now, how does population come into that? Well, it's no coincidence that when I was a kid playing with Husi and the other mates, there were only two million people in that country of Rwanda. By 94, they'd gone up fourfold to eight million. And it's not me just saying that. Here is Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture from just before the genocide, writing after it, rapid population growth is the major driving force behind the vicious circle of environmental scarcities and poverty. You can read about that at the website. And there's good evidence all over the world that failed states, terrorism, and genocides are all more likely when there's a population bulge of young people. When these, there's about 30 or 40 percent in that age group, uh, that is meaning that there are lots of young men, usually unemployed, feral, loads of testosterone, and you get the violence. And that was certainly the case in Rwanda in 1994, this population bulge. 
So again, I can argue, can't I, that conflict is caused by too many humans very often. It's a background factor in that. And the pill is mightier than the sword. What about climate change? Well, very quickly, I would argue, we all know about climate change, but I argue that climate change is in some measure caused by the number of climate change us, isn't it? With the three billion people in India and China and, uh, and Brazil and so on getting out of the poverty situation into the middle classes, they're bound to produce more carbon dioxide when they do that. Uh, and so having fewer people or stabilizing our numbers at the lowest number we can has to help climate change. And it's real, folks. I hope there are no, no climate change deniers in this audience. They still exist, though. They'd rather believe it wasn't true. Yet, as you see there, each decade's getting hotter. And it, what is really striking me is it's not a future thing now. It's with us today. You only have to look at the 100-year type climatic catastrophes that are happening somewhere now in the world every month. It's not a future thing anymore. For example, in 2011, there were really extreme floods in Brazil, in Australia, in Thailand, and in the Philippines in that one year. And of course, floods can be caused also by the sea level rising from uh, the ice sheets melting. And right here in London, it's not impossible that we might be seeing something like this. So growing world population is going to cause, you had this quote earlier, a perfect storm of food, energy, and water shortages by 2030. By 2030. And he's not just saying that as an opinion. This is factual. This is based on fact. This is where the trends are leading. Sustainability, ladies and gentlemen, is not a choice, is it? We have a finite planet, 70% salt water, half the rest mountain, desert, and ice cap. We can't go on packing in 80 million a year indefinitely. So the ultimate inconvenient truth has to be the planet is finite. Sustainability has to happen. It's only a choice of which way we do it. Surely the gentle way of family planning is far better than all those nasty ways that otherwise are certain to happen on the right. And yet, there are insane taboos still about mentioning population and family planning in these contexts. It becomes, it has become very much the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Well, we're talking about it today, and I hope you'll go on talking about it when you leave this room to your, your mates, because it's so crucial. It's almost like we're on the Titanic, folks. And what you read about in the newspapers and see on the television, and most of the time, is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Is time running out? Not quite yet, but getting close. Now, you may wonder why I show this little clip. This is to get me off my soapbox and to be a little bit more empowering and positive. We're not dead yet. Uh, there is only a few seconds left to midnight, but they're still there and we can do something. And don't worry, penguins love ice cold water. So it's just a game. Right, what are we going to do? How do we solve these dreadful problems? First of all, we go back to basics and remember the IPAT equation, the most important equation in the world, in my view, which was devised four decades ago by Holdren and Ehrlich in America. Environmental impact only has three factors. Nobody's ever discovered any more. One is how green is your technology per person. The next is affluence, which always causes effluence, namely pollution, and consumption, again, per person. And the third one is population and the number of persons. There's no other factors. So, OK, we want to do something about this. Technology can help. I'm a lover of technology. I think this stuff, graphene, is really exciting for the future, and so on. But in these, these technological advances aren't going to be enough. The scientists themselves tell us that. What about affluence? Now, that factor, folks, ought to go up. Do you agree? Because there are so many poor people in the world. Billions of them. I already mentioned the three billion that are beginning to succeed in coming out of poverty. But as they do that, the A factor has to come up, however much we reluctantly are dragged kicking and screaming to reduce our consumption in the already rich world. We're not going to do enough. So A is going up. What are you left with? 
the very one that's the elephant in the room people won't want to talk about, the P factor, population. So you see, it's two sides of the same coin. We have to address all of these. I'm not saying population is the only answer. It's the neglected area. And you see, one coin is population increase, and the other is overconsumption of resources, which is the A and the T together. And we need to address them both by family planning on the left and by living gentler lives. Do you know the five R's of the environment? Refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle, and bicycle. Uh, and I've just cycled here on my Brompton, and I hope most of us use public transport or, or bicycles. These things we need to do, I'm not a populationist, folks. I'm an environmentalist. I'm a futurist, trying to make a half-decent future for all of us in the future. That's me on my Brompton, yeah. <laughs> there are only those three factors. And there's some good news, actually, with regard to the P factor. The average total fertility rate, which is the family size of the world, is now down to 2.4, which is almost replacement, an average on the world. The problem we still have is higher birth rates in sub-Saharan Africa, where I came from, but also a bulge, population momentum, this bulge, which I mentioned earlier, of children already born. Uh, and if you go to Uganda, where I went to school, I went to school in Kabali, uh, if you go to Uganda, you find that 50% of Ugandans only are grown up. The other half, 49%, are under the age of 15. And they haven't any kids yet. So clearly, countries like that will still produce a huge increase in numbers. And it's a youth quake. You can read about this. This is my little booklet on this, which you can get at our website, Population Matters. Youth quake. Okay, wrapping it up. This is my choice of medical specialty. Right back when I was your sort of age, as a, uh, still a student, a uh, medical <laughs> student, I attended a lecture very like this one, funnily enough. And I decided the most important branch of medicine must be family planning, and I made that my specialty. I did it on environmental grounds, family planning for the environment. I was ahead of the game. I don't know any other doctor in the world who chose his medical specialty solely because of concern about the environment and made it family planning. Isn't it true, you, you might be saying, that in rural poverty, poor people set out to have large families? You've often heard this story. Every mouth has two hands. They need to work for the family and supply a measure of social security. Also, High infant mortality, you must have more kids to compensate for it. That's a half-truth, folks. What is really going on? It's back to sex. I tell you, ordinary people, poor people, are simply having reasonably regular sex, which is something we all do when we get the choice. But to have a small family ain't possible because they, there's something that ought to be there and isn't, namely family planning. So which parents in this room, I don't know how many parents we've got here, if you had two kids, did you only have sex twice? If you have three kids, didn't you only have sex three times? Of course not. We humans have an awful lot of sex. And you've got to be afraid that you're going to cause an unwanted pregnancy almost every time without contraception. Large families are the default state of the planet, of all people, couples, whether they're rich or poor. And they will always happen unless we meet the needs of women to control their fertility as they want to do, Poor people are not actually targeting having large families, then just simply failing to be able to not have them. You with me? Through absence of family planning. When they are so able, we can follow the great examples around the world of success stories. You can read the countries for yourselves, which halved their average family sizes, which is what TFR means, in the same time as China. And what happened? How did they do it? They removed the barriers to women's choice using education and the media, but without coercion. One thing is clear. In every country with more than two children, there are many barriers, non-availability of methods, misinformation and myths, the malign influence of males blocking female empowerment and rights and not good at putting our brains and our genitals together, you remember? There's fatalism about having children, and it's always happened. Women aren't realizing that they could even have an option a lot of the time. And there's religious dogma. Good news there. Did you know Melinda Gates is a Catholic? And she has produced the most fantastic TED lecture, which you all go to. And its title says it all. Let's put birth control back on the agenda. You can just Google Melinda Gates, April 2012. And it says what I'm saying now from the 
direct danger point of view. What's going on here? This is something happening in Kew Gardens in 1994, the Eco Time Capsule Project, which I set up. And it was based on this saying, we have not inherited the Earth from our grandparents, we borrowed it from our grandchildren. It began on World Environment Day, and it ends in 2044, because that's 50 years, therefore our grandchildren. And it's apologizing to the future for the fact that we, that we have so messed up their loan. However, we also wrote letters inside this capsule, which they're meant to be digging up, which said, we actually so hope that all of us will get our act together, that when you dig up the time capsule in 2044, you'll wonder why we're apologizing. Wouldn't that be amazing? If we could just do that. Again, ecotimecapsule.com if you want to visit the website. I'm just finishing. We need to think about our own family building. And you could argue in a rich country that having a large family actually damages the planet more than a poor country because of our high consumption. So a good guideline is actually two children. And we don't want these children that are coming along just to be looking out, do we, over burnt out rainforests. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every child on Earth was born by educated, caring choice and not by chance? Thank you for your attention.